Hello and welcome. This will be a reading of My Life and Work by Henry Ford, as read by Livid Productions. My Life and Work. Introduction. What is the idea? We've only started on our development of our country. We have not as yet, with all our talk of wonderful progress, done more than scratch the surface. The progress has been wonderful enough, but when we compare what we have done with what there is to do, then our past accomplishments are as nothing. When we consider that more power is used merely in plowing the soil than is used in all the industrial establishments of the country put together, an inkling comes of how much opportunity there is ahead. And now, with so many countries of the world in ferment, and with so much unrest everywhere, is an excellent time to suggest something of the things that may be done, in the light of what has been done. When one speaks of increasing power, machinery, and industry, there comes up a picture of a cold, metallic sort of world, in which great factories will drive away the trees, the flowers, the birds, and the green fields. And that, then, we shall have a world composed of metal machines and human machines. With all of that, I do not agree. I think that unless we know more about machines and their use, unless we better understand the mechanical portion of life, we cannot have the time to enjoy the trees and the birds and the flowers and the green fields. I think that we have already done too much towards banishing the pleasant things from life by thinking there is some opposition between living and providing the means of living. We waste so much time and energy that we have little left over in which to enjoy ourselves. Power and machinery, money and goods, are useful only as they set us free to live. They are but means to an end. For instance, I do not consider the machines which bear my name simply as machines. If that was all there was to it, I would do something else. I take them as concrete evidence of the working out of a theory of business, which I hope is something more than a theory of business, a theory that looks inward, making this world a better place in which to live. The fact that the commercial success of the Ford Motor Company has been most unusual is important only because it serves to demonstrate in a way which no one can fail to understand the theory that the theory to date is right. Considered solely in this light, I can criticize the prevailing system of industry and the organization of money in society from the standpoint of one who has not been beaten by them. As things are now organized, I could, were I thinking only selfishly, ask for no change. If I merely want money, the present system is alright. It gives money and plenty to me, but I am thinking of service. The present system does not permit of the best service, because it encourages every kind of waste. It keeps many men from getting the full return from service, and it is going nowhere. It is all a matter of better planning and adjustment. I have no quarrel with the general attitude of scoffing at new ideas. It is better to be skeptical of all new ideas, and to insist upon being shown, rather than to rush around in a continuous brainstorm after every new idea. Skepticism, if by that we mean cautiousness, is the balance wheel of civilization. Most of the present acute troubles of the world arise out of taking on new ideas without first carefully investigating to rediscover if they are good ideas. An idea is not necessarily good because it is old or necessarily bad because it is new, but if an old idea works, then the weight of the evidence is all in its favor. Ideas are of themselves extraordinarily valuable, but an idea is just an idea. Almost anyone can think up an idea. The thing that counts is developing it into a practical product. I am now most interested in fully demonstrating that the ideas we have put into practice are capable of the largest application, that they have nothing peculiarly to do with motor cars or tractors, but form something in the nature of a universal code. I am quite certain that it is the natural code, and I want to demonstrate it so thoroughly that it will be accepted, not as the new idea, 
but as a natural code. The natural thing to do is to work, to recognize prosperity and happiness can be only obtained through honest effort. Human ills flow largely from attempting to escape from this natural course. I have no suggestion which goes beyond accepting in its fullest this principle of nature. I take it for granted that we must work. All that we have done comes as the result of a certain instance, that since we must work, it is better to work intelligently and forehandedly, that the better we do our work, the better off we shall be, all of which I conceive to be merely elemental common sense. I am not a reformer. I think there is entirely too much attempt at reforming the world, and that we pay too much attention to reformers. We have two kinds of reformers. Both are nuisances. The man who calls himself a reformer wants to smash things. He is the sort of man who would tear up a whole shirt because the collar button did not fit the buttonhole. It would never occur to him to enlarge the buttonhole. This sort of reformer, never under any circumstances, knows what he is doing. Experience and reform do not go together. A reformer cannot keep his zeal at white heat. In the presence of a fact, he must discard all facts. Since 1914, a great many persons have received brand new intellectual outfits. Many are beginning to think for the first time. They opened their eyes and realized that they were in the world. Then, with a thrill of independence, they realized that they could look at the world critically. They did so and found it faulty. The intoxication of assuming the masterful position of a critic of the social system, which it is every man's right to assume, is unbalancing at first. The very young critic is very much unbalanced. He is strongly in favor of wiping out the old order and starting a new one. They actually managed to start a new world in Russia. It is there that the work of the world makers can best be studied. We learn from Russia that it is the minority and not the majority who determine destructive action. We learn also that while men may decree social laws in conflict with natural laws, nature vetoes those laws more ruthlessly than did the czars. Nature has vetoed the whole Soviet Republic, for it sought to deny nature. It denied above all else the right to the fruits of labor. Some people say Russia will have to go to work, but that does not describe the case. The fact is that poor Russia is at work, but her work counts for nothing. It is not free work. In the United States, a workman works eight hours a day. In Russia, he works 12 to 14. In the United States, if a workman wishes to lay off a day or a week and is able to afford it, there is nothing to prevent him. In Russia, under Sovietism, the workman goes to work whether he wants to or not. The freedom of the citizen has disappeared in the discipline of a prison-like monotony in which all are treated alike. That is slavery. Freedom is the right to work a decent length of time and to get a decent living for doing so. To be able to arrange the little personal details of one's own life. It is the aggregate of these and many other items of freedom which makes up the great idealistic freedom. The minor forms of freedom lubricate the everyday life of all of us. Russia could not get along without intelligence and experience. As soon as she began to run her factories by committees, they went to rack and ruin. There was more debate than production. As soon as they threw out the skilled man, thousands of tons of precious materials were spoiled. The fanatics talked the people into starvation. The Soviets are now offering the engineers, the administrators, the foremen, and superintendents, whom at first they drove out, large sums of money. If only they will come back. Bolshevism is now crying for the brains and experience which it yesterday treated so ruthlessly. All that reform did to Russia 
was to block production. There is, in this country, a sinister element that desires to creep in between the men who work with their hands and the men who think and plan for the men who work with their hands. The same influence that drove the brain's experience and ability out of Russia is busily engaged in raising prejudice here. We must not suffer the stranger, the destroyer, the hater of happy humanity to divide our people. In unity is American strength and freedom. On the other hand, we have a different kind of reformer who never calls himself one. He is singularly like the radical reformer. The radical has had no experience and does not want it. The other class of reformer has had plenty of experience, but it does him no good. I refer to the reactionary, who will be surprised to find himself put in exactly the same class as the Bolshevist. He wants to go back to some previous condition. Not because it was the best condition, but because he thinks he knows about that condition. The one crowd wants to smash up the whole world in order to make a better one. The other holds the world as so good that it might well be let stand as it is. And decay. The second notion arises as does the first, out of not using the eyes to see with. It is perfectly possible to smash this world, but it is not possible to build a new one. It is possible to prevent the world from going forward, but it is not possible then to prevent it from going back, from decaying. It is foolish to expect that, if everything be overturned, everyone will thereby get three meals a day, or should everything be petrified, that thereby 6% interest may be paid. The trouble is that the reformers and reactionaries alike get away from the realities, from the primary functions. One of the counsels of caution is to be very certain that we do not mistake a reactionary turn for a return of common sense. We have passed through a period of fireworks of every description, and the making of a great many idealistic maps of progress. We did not get anywhere. It was a convention, not a march. Lovely things were said, but when we got home, we found the furnace out. Reactionaries have frequently taken advantage of the recoil from such a period, and they have promised the good old times, which usually means the bad old abuses. And because they are perfectly void of vision, they are sometimes regarded as a practical men. Their return to power is often hailed as the return of common sense. The primary functions are agriculture, manufacture, and transportation. Community life is impossible without them. They hold the world together. Raising things, making things, and carrying things are as primitive as human need, and yet as modern as anything can be. They are the essence of physical life. When they cease, community life ceases. Things do get out of shape in this present world under the present system, but we may hope for a betterment if the foundations stand sure. The great delusion is that one may change the foundation, usurp the part of destiny in the social process. The foundations of society are the men and means to grow things, to make things, to carry things. As long as agriculture, manufacture, and transportation survive, the world can survive any economic or social change. As we serve our jobs, we serve the world. There is plenty of work to do. Business is merely work. Speculation in things already produced, that is not business. It is more or less respectable graft, but it cannot be legislated out of existence. Laws can do very little. Law never does anything constructive. It can never be more than a policeman. And so it is a waste of time to look to our state capitals or to Washington to do that which was not designed to do. As long as we look to legislation to cure poverty or to abolish special privilege, we are going to see poverty spread and special privilege grow. 
We have had enough of looking to Washington, and we have had enough of legislators. Not so much, however, in this, as in other countries, promising laws to do that which laws cannot do. When you get a whole country, as did ours, thinking that Washington is a sort of heaven and behind its clouds dwell omniscience and omnipotence, you are educating that country into a dependent state of mind, which augurs ill for the future. Our help does not come from Washington, but from ourselves. Our help may, however, go to Washington as a sort of central distribution point, where all our efforts are coordinated for the general good. We may help the government. The government cannot help us. The slogan of less government in business and more business in government is a very good one, not mainly on account of business or government, but on account of the people. Business is not the reason why the United States was founded. The Declaration of Independence is not a business charter, nor is the Constitution of the United States a commercial schedule. The United States, its land, people, government, and business, are but methods by which the life of the people is made worthwhile. The government is a servant, and never should be anything but a servant. The moment the people become agents to the government, then the law of retribution begins to work. For such a revelation is unnatural, immoral, and inhuman. We cannot live without business, and we cannot live without government. Business and government are necessary as servants, like water and grain. As masters, they overturn the natural order. The welfare of the country is squarely up to us as individuals. That is where it should be, and that is where it is safest. Governments can promise something for nothing, but they cannot deliver. They can juggle the currencies as they did in Europe, and as bankers the world over do, as long as they get the benefit of the juggling, with a patter of solemn nonsense. But it is work and work alone that can continue to deliver the goods. And that, down in his heart, is what every man knows. There is little chance of an intelligent people, such as ours, ruining the fundamental processes of economic life. Most men know that they cannot get something for nothing. Most men feel, even if they do not know, that money is not wealth. The ordinary theories which promise everything to everybody, and demand nothing from anybody, are promptly denied by the instincts of the ordinary man. Even when he does not find reasons against them, he knows they are wrong. That is enough. The present order, always clumsy, often stupid, and in many ways imperfect, has this advantage over any other. It works. Doubtless, our order will merge by degrees into another, and the new one will also work. But not so much by reason of what it is, as by reason of what men will bring into it. The reason why Bolshevism did not work, and cannot work, is not economic. It does not matter whether industry is privately managed or socially controlled. It does not matter whether you call the workers share wages or dividends. It does not matter whether you regimentalize the people as to food, clothing, and shelter, or whether you allow them to eat, dress, and live as they like. Those are mere matters of detail. The incapacity of the Bolshevist leaders is indicated by the fuss they made over such details. Bolshevism failed because it was both unnatural and immoral. Our system stands. Is it wrong? Of course it's wrong. At a thousand points. Is it clumsy? Of course it is clumsy. By all right and reason, it ought to break down. But it does not. Because it is instinct with certain economic and moral fundamentals. The economic fundamental is labor. Labor is the human element which makes the fruitful seasons of the earth useful to men. It is men's labor that makes the harvest what it is. That is the economic fundamental. Every one of us is working with material which we did not and could not create. 
but which was presented to us by nature. The moral fundamental is human's right in his labor. This is variously stated. It is sometimes called the right of property. It is sometimes masked in the command, Thou shalt not steal. It is the other man's right in his property that makes stealing a crime. When a man has earned his bread, he has a right to that bread. If another man steals it, he does more than steal bread. He invades a sacred human right. If we cannot produce, we cannot have. But some say, if we produce, it is only for the capitalists. Capitalists who become such because they provide better means of production are the foundations of society. They have really nothing of their own. They merely manage property for the benefit of others. Capitalists who become such through trading in money are a temporarily necessary evil. They may not be evil at all if their money goes to production. If their money goes to complicating distribution, to raising barriers between the producer and consumer, then they are evil capitalists. And they will pass away when money is better adjusted to work. And money will become better adjusted to work when it is fully realized that through work and work alone may health, wealth, and happiness inevitably be secured. There is no reason why a man who is willing to work should not be able to work and to receive the full value of his work. There is equally no reason why a man who can but will not work should not receive the full value of his services to the community. He should most certainly be permitted to take away from the community an equivalent of what he contributes to it. If he contributes nothing, he should take away nothing. He should have the freedom of starvation. We are not getting anywhere when we insist that every man ought to have more than he deserves to have, just because some do get more than they deserve to have. There can be no greater absurdity and no greater disservice to humanity in general than to insist that all men are equal. Most certainly all men are not equal. And any democratic conception which strives to make men equal is only an effort to block progress. Men cannot be of equal service. The men of larger ability are less numerous than the men of smaller ability. It is possible for a mass of the smaller men to pull the larger ones down. But in so doing, they pull themselves down. It is the larger men who give the leadership to the community and enable the smaller men to live with less effort. The conception of democracy which names a leveling down of ability makes for waste. No two things in nature are alike. We build our cars absolutely interchangeable. All parts are nearly alike as chemical analysis, the finest machinery, and the finest workmanship can make them. No fitting of any kind is required, and it would certainly seem that two Fords standing side by side looking exactly alike and made so exactly alike that any part could be taken out of one and put into the other would be alike. But they are not. They will have different road habits. We have men who have driven hundreds and in some cases thousands of Fords. And they say that no two ever act precisely the same. That if they should drive a new car for an hour or even less and then the car were mixed with a bunch of other new ones, also each driven for a single hour and under the same conditions, that although they could not recognize the car they had been driving merely by looking at it, they could do so by driving it. I have been speaking in general terms. Let us be more concrete. A man ought to be able to live on a scale commensurate with the service that he renders. This is rather a good time to talk about this point. For we have recently been through a period when the rendering of service was the last thing that most people thought of. We were getting to a place where no one cared about costs or service. Orders came without effort. Whereas once it was the customer who favored the merchant by dealing with him, conditions changed until it was the merchant who favored the customer by selling to him. That is bad for business. Monopoly is bad for business. Profiteering is bad for business. The lack of necessity to hustle is bad for business. 
business is never as healthy as when, like a chicken, it must do a certain amount of scratching for what it gets. Things were coming too easily. There was a letdown of the principle that an honest relation ought to obtain between values and prices. The public no longer had to be catered to. There was even a public be damned attitude in many places. It was intensely bad for business. Some men called that abnormal condition prosperity. It was not prosperity. It was just a needless money chase. Money chasing is not business. It is very easy, unless one keeps a plan thoroughly in mind, to get burdened with money and then, in an effort to make more money, to forget all about selling to the people that they want. Business on a money-making basis is most insecure. It is a touch-and-go affair. Moving irregularly, and rarely over a term of years, amounting to much. It is the function of business to produce for consumption and not for money or speculation. Producing for consumption implies that the quality of the article produced will be high and that the price will be low, that the article be one which serves the people and not merely the producer. If the money feature is twisted out of its proper perspective, then the production will be twisted to serve the producer. The producer depends for his prosperity upon serving the people. He may get by for a while serving himself, but if he does, it will be purely accidental, and when the people wake up to the fact that they are not being served, the end of that producer is in sight. During the boom period, the larger effort of production was to serve itself, and hence, the moment the people woke up, many producers went to smash. They said that they had entered into a period of depression. Really, they had not. They were simply trying to pit nonsense against sense, which is something that cannot successfully be done. Being greedy for money is the surest way not to get it. But when one serves for the sake of service, for the satisfaction of doing that which one believes to be right, then money abundantly takes care of itself. Money comes naturally as the result of service, and it is absolutely necessary to have money. But we do not want to forget that the end of money is not ease, but the opportunity to perform more service. In my mind, nothing is more abhorrent than a life of ease. None of us has any right to ease. There is no place in civilization for the idler. Any scheme looking to abolish money is only making affairs more complex, for we must have a measure. That our present system of money is a satisfactory basis for exchange is a matter of grave doubt. That is a question which I shall talk of in a subsequent chapter. The gist of my objection to the present monetary system is that it tends to become a thing of itself, and to block instead of facilitate production. My effort is in the direction of simplicity. People in general have so little, and it costs so much to buy even the barest necessities, let alone that share of the luxuries to which I think everyone is entitled. Because nearly everything that we make is much more complex than it needs to be. Our clothing, our food, our household furnishings, all could be much simpler than they are now, and at the same time, be better looking. Things in the past were made in certain ways, and makers since then have just followed. I do not mean that we should adopt freak styles. There is no need for that. Clothing need not be a bag with a hole cut in it. That might be easy to make, but it would be inconvenient to wear. A blanket does not require much tailoring, but none of us could get much work done if we went around Indian fashion in blankets. Real simplicity means that which gives us the very best service, and is the most convenient in use. The trouble with drastic reforms is that they always insist that man be made over in order to use certain designed articles. I think that dress reform for women, which seems to mean ugly clothes, must always originate with 
plain women who want to make everyone else look plain. That is not the right process. Start with an article that suits, and then study to find some way of eliminating the entirely useless parts. This applies to everything. A shoe, a dress, a house, a piece of machinery, a railroad, a steamship, an airplane. As we cut out useless parts and simplify necessary ones, we also cut down the cost of making. This is simple logic. But oddly enough, the ordinary process starts with a cheapening of the manufacturing instead of with a simplifying of the article. The start ought to be with the article. First, we ought to find whether it is as well made as it should be. Does it give the best possible service? Then, are the materials the best or merely the most expensive? Then, can its complexity and weight be cut down? And so on. There is no more sense in having extra weight in an article than there is in the cockade on a coachman's hat. In fact, there is not as much, for the cockade may help the coachman to identify his hat, while the extra weight means only a waste of strength. I cannot imagine where the delusion that weight means strength came from. It is all well enough in a pile driver, but why move a heavy weight if we are not going to hit anything with it? In transportation, why put extra weight in a machine? Why not add it to the load that the machine is designed to carry? Fat men cannot run as fast as thin men, but we build most our vehicles as though dead weight fat increased speed. A deal of poverty grows out of the carriage of excess weight. Someday, we shall discover how to further eliminate weight. Take wood, for example. For certain purposes, wood is now the best substance we know. But wood is extremely wasteful. The wood in a Ford car contains 30 pounds of water. There must be some way of doing better than that. There must be some method by which we can gain the same strength and elasticity without having to lug useless weight. And so, through a thousand processes. A farmer makes too complex an affair out of his daily work. I believe that the average farmer puts to a really useful purpose only about 5% of the energy that he spends. If anyone ever equipped a factory in the style, say, the average farm is fitted out, the place would be cluttered with men. The worst factory in Europe is hardly as bad as the average farm burn. Power is utilized to the least possible degree. Not only is everything done by hand, but seldom is a thought given to logical arrangement. A farmer doing his chores will walk up and down a rickety ladder a dozen times. He will carry water for years instead of putting in a few lengths of pipe. His whole idea when there is extra work to do is to hire extra men. He thinks of putting money into improvements as an expense. Farm products at their lowest prices are dearer than they ought to be. Farm profits at their highest are lower than they ought to be. It is waste motion, waste effort, that makes the farm prices high and profits low. On my own farm at Dearborn, we do everything by machinery. We have eliminated a great number of wastes, but we have not as yet touched on real economy. We have not yet been able to put in five or ten years of intense night and day study to discover what really ought to be done. We have left more undone than we have done. Yet at no time, no matter what the value of crops, have we failed to turn a first-class profit. We are not farmers. We are industrialists on the farm. The moment the farmer considers himself an industrialist, with a horror of waste either in material or in men, then we are going to have farm products so low priced that all will have enough to eat, and the profits will be so satisfactory that farming will be considered as among the least hazardous and most profitable of occupations. The lack of knowledge of what is going on and the lack of knowledge of what the job really is, and the best way of doing it, are the reasons why farming is thought not to pay. Nothing could pay the way farming is conducted. The farmer follows luck and his forefathers. He does not know how economically to produce, and he does not know how to market. A manufacturer who knew how neither to produce nor to market would not stay long in business. That the farmer can stay on shows how wonderfully profitable farming can be. The way to attain low-priced, high-volume production in the factory or on the farm, 
low-priced, high-volume production means plenty for everyone. It's quite simple. The trouble is that the general tendency is to complicate very simple affairs. Take, for instance, an improvement. When we talk about improvements, usually we have in mind some change in a product. An improved product is one that has been changed. That is not my idea. I do not believe in starting to make until I have discovered the best possible thing. This of course does not mean that a product should never be changed. I think that it will be found more economical in the end, not even to try to produce an article until you have fully satisfied yourself that utility, design, and material are the best. If your researches do not give you that confidence, then keep right on searching until you find the confidence. The place to start manufacturing is with the article. The factory, the organization, the selling, and the financial plans will shape themselves to the article. You will have a cutting edge on your business chisel, and in the end, you will save time. Rushing into manufacturing without being certain of the product is the unrecognized cause of many business failures. People seem to think that the big thing is the factory, or the store, or the financial backing of the management. The big thing is the product, and any hurry in getting into fabrication before designs are completed is just so much waste time. I spent 12 years before I had a Model T, which is what is known today as the Ford car that suited me. We did not attempt to go into real production until we had a real product. That product has not been essentially changed. We are constantly experimenting with new ideas. If you travel the roads in the neighborhood of Dearborn, you can find all sorts of models of Ford cars. They are experimental cars. They are not new models. I do not believe in letting any good idea get by me. But I will not quickly decide whether an idea is good or bad. If an idea seems good, or seems even to have possibilities, I believe in doing whatever is necessary to test out the idea from every angle. But testing out the idea is something very different from making a change in the car. Where most manufacturers find themselves quicker to make a change in the product than in the method of manufacturing, we follow exactly the opposite course. Our big changes have been in the methods of manufacturing. They never stand still. I believe that there is hardly a single operation in the making of our car that is the same as when we made our first car of the present model. That is why we make them so cheaply. The few changes that have been made in the car have been in the direction of convenience, in use, or where we found that a change in design might give added strength. The materials in the car change as we learn more and more about materials. Also, we do not want to be held up in production, or have the expense of production increased by any possible shortages in a particular material. So we have, for most parts, worked out substitute materials. Vanadium steel, for instance, is our principal steel. With it, we can get the greatest strength with the least weight. But it would not be good business to let our whole future depend on being able to get vanadium steel. We have worked out a substitute. All our steels are special. But for every one of them, we have at least one, and sometimes several fully proved and tested substitutes, and so on through all of our materials and likewise with our parts. In the beginning, we made very few of our parts and none of our motors. Now, we make all our motors and most of our parts, because we find it cheaper to do so. But also, we aim to make some of every part, so that we cannot be caught in any market emergency or be crippled by some outside manufacturer being unable to fill his orders. The prices on glass were run up outrageously high during the war. We are among the largest users of glass in the country. Now we are putting up our own glass factory. If we had devoted all of this energy to making changes in the product, we should be nowhere. But by not changing the product, we are able to give our energy to the improvement of the making. The principal part of a chisel is the cutting edge. If there is a single principle on which our business rests, it is that. It makes no difference how finely made a chisel is or what a splendid steel it has in it, 
or how well it is forged. If it has no cutting edge, it is not a chisel. It is just a piece of metal. All of which being translated means that it is what a thing does, not what it is supposed to do, that matters. What is the use of putting a tremendous force behind a blunt chisel if a light blow on a sharp chisel will do the work? The chisel is there to cut, not to be hammered. Hammering is only incidental to the job. So, if we want to work, why not concentrate on the work, and do it in the quickest possible fashion? The cutting edge of merchandising is the point where the product touches the consumer. An unsatisfactory product is one that has a dull cutting edge. A lot of waste effort is needed to put it through. The cutting edge of a factory is the man and the machine on the job. If the man is not right, the machine cannot be. If the machine is not right, the man cannot be. For anyone to be required to use more force than is absolutely necessary for the job in hand is waste. The essence of my idea, then, is that waste and greed block the delivery of true service. Both waste and greed are unnecessary. Waste is due largely to not understanding what one does or being careless in the doing of it. Greed is merely a species of nearsightedness. I have striven towards manufacturing with a minimum of waste, both of materials and of human effort, and then toward distribution at a minimum of profit, depending for the total profit upon the volume of distribution. In the process of manufacturing, I want to distribute the maximum of wage, that is, the maximum of buying power. Since also this makes for a minimum cost and we sell at a minimum profit, we can distribute a product in consonance with buying power. Thus, everyone who is connected with us, either as a manager, worker, or purchaser, is the better for our existence. The institution that we have erected is performing a service. That is the only reason I have for talking about it. The principles of that service are these. Number one, an absence of fear of the future and a veneration for the past. One who wears the future who fears failure, limits his activities. Failure is only the opportunity, more intelligently, to begin again. There is no disgrace in honest failure. There is disgrace in fearing to fail. What is past is useful, only as it suggests ways and means for progress. Number two, a disregard of competition. Whoever does a thing best ought to be the one to do it. It is criminal to try to get business away from another man. Criminal because one is then trying to lower for personal gain the condition of one's fellow man, to rule by force instead of by intelligence. Number three, the putting of service before profit. Without a profit, business cannot extend. There is nothing inherently wrong about making a profit. Well-conducted business enterprise cannot fail to return a profit. But profit must and inevitably will come as a reward for good service. It cannot be the basis, it must be the result of service. Number four, manufacturing is not buying low and selling high. It is the process of buying materials fairly and, with the smallest possible addition of cost, transforming those materials into a consumable product and giving it to the consumer. Gambling speculating and sharp dealing tend only to clog this progression how all of this arose and how it has worked out and how it applies generally are the subjects of these chapters chapter one the beginning of business on may 31st 1921 the ford motor company turned out car number Five million. It is out in my museum, along with the gasoline buggy that I began work on 30 years before, and which first ran satisfactorily along in the spring of 1893. I was running it when the bubblings came to Dearborn, and they always come on April 2nd. There's all the difference in the world in the appearance of the two vehicles, and almost as much difference in construction and materials 
but in fundamentals, the two are curiously alike, except that the old buggy is on it a few wrinkles that we have not quite yet adopted on our modern car. For that first car or buggy, even though it had built two cylinders, would make 20 miles an hour and run 60 miles on three gallons of gas the little tank held, and is as good today as the day it was built. The development in methods of manufacture and in materials has been greater than the development in basic design. The whole design has been refined. The present Ford car, which is the Model T, has four cylinders and a self-starter. It is in every way a more convenient and easier riding car. It is simpler than the first car, but almost every point in it may also be found in the first car. The changes have been brought about through experience in the making, and not through any change in the basic principle, which I take to be an important fact, demonstrating that given a good idea to start with, it is better to concentrate on perfecting it than to hunt around for a new idea. One idea at a time is about as much as any one can handle. It was life on the farm that drove me into devising ways and means to better transportation. I was born on July 30th of 1863 on a farm at Dearborn, Michigan, and my earliest recollection is that, considering the results, there was too much work on the place. That is still the way I feel about farming. There is a legend that my parents were very poor, and that the early days were hard ones. Certainly, they were not rich, but neither were they poor. As Michigan farmers went, we were prosperous. The house in which I was born is still standing, and it and the farm are part of my present holding. There was too much hard hand labor on our own and all other farms of the time. Even when I was very young, I suspected that much might somehow be done in a better way. That is what took me into mechanics. Although my mother always said that I was born a mechanic, I had a kind of workshop with odds and ends of metal for tools before I had anything else. In those days, we did not have toys of today. What we had were homemade. My toys were all tools. And they still are. And every fragment of machinery was a treasure. The biggest event of those early days was meeting with a road engine about eight miles out of Detroit one day when we were driving into town. I was then 12 years old. The second biggest event was getting a watch, which happened in the same year. I remember that engine as though I had seen it only yesterday, for it was the first vehicle other than horse-drawn that I had ever seen. It was intended primarily for driving threshing machines and sawmills and was simply a portable engine and boiler mounted on wheels with a water tank and coal cart trailing behind. I had seen plenty of these engines hauled around by horses, but this one had a chain that made a connection between the engine and the rear wheels of the wagon-like frame on which the boiler was mounted. The engine was placed over the boiler, and one man, standing on the platform behind the boiler, shoveled coal managed the throttle, and did the steering. It had been made by Nichols, Shepard and Company of Battle Creek. I found that out at once. The engine had stopped to let us pass with our horses, and I was off the wagon and talking to the engineer before my father, who was driving, knew what I was up to. The engineer was very glad to explain the whole affair. He was proud of it. He showed me how the chain was disconnected from the propelling wheel and a belt put on to drive the other machinery. He told me that the engine made 200 revolutions a minute, and the chain pinion could be shifted to let the wagon stop while the engine was still running. This last is a feature which, although in different fashion, is incorporated into modern automobiles. It was not important with steam engines, which are easily stopped and started, but it became very important with gasoline engines. It was that engine which took me into automotive transportation. I tried to make models of it, and some years later, I did make one that ran very well. But from the time I saw that road engine as a boy of 12 right forward to today, my great interest has been making a machine that would travel the roads. Driving to town, I always had a pocket full of trinkets, nuts, washers, and odds and ends of machinery. Often I took a broken watch and tried to put it together. 
Now I was 13, I managed for the first time to put a watch together so that it would keep time. By the time I was 15, I could do almost anything in watch repairing, although my tools were of the crudest. There is an immense amount to be learned simply by tinkering with things. It is not possible to learn from books how everything is made, and a real mechanic ought to know how nearly everything is made. Machines are to a mechanic what books are to a writer. He gets ideas from them, and if he has any brains, he will apply those ideas. From the beginning, I never could work up much interest in the labor of farming. I wanted to have something to do with machinery. My father was not entirely in sympathy with my bent towards mechanics. He thought that I ought to be a farmer. When I left school at 17 and became an apprentice in the machine shop of the Dry Dock Engine Works, I was all but given up for lost. I passed my apprenticeship without trouble. That is, I was qualified to be a machinist long before my three-year term had expired. And having a liking for fine work and a leaning towards watches, I worked nights repairing in a jewelry shop. At one period of those early days, I think that I must have had fully 300 watches. I thought that I could build a serviceable watch for around 30 cents, and nearly started in the business. But I did not, because I figured out that watches were not universal necessities, and therefore people generally would not buy them. Just how I reached that surprising conclusion I am unable to state. I did not like the ordinary jewelry and watchmaking work, excepting where the job was hard to do. Even then, I wanted to make something in quantity. It was just about the time when the standard railroad time was being arranged. We had formerly been on sun time for quite a while. Just as in our present daylight savings days, the railroad time differed from the local time. That bothered me a good deal, and so, I succeeded in making a watch that kept both times. It had two dials, and it was quite a curiosity in the neighborhood. In 1879, that is, about four years after I sold that Nickel Shepherd machine, I managed to get a chance to run one. And when my apprenticeship was over, I worked with a local representative of the Westinghouse Company of Schenectady as an expert in the setting up and repair of their road engines. The engine they put out was much the same as the Nickel Shepherd engine, excepting that the power was applied to the back wheels by a belt. They could make 12 miles an hour on the road, even though the self-propelling feature was only an incident of the construction. They were sometimes used as tractors to pull heavy loads, and if the owner also happened to be in the threshing machine business, he hitched his threshing machine and other paraphernalia to the engine in moving from farm to farm. What bothered me was the weight and the cost. They weighed a couple of tons, and were far too expensive to be owned by other than a farmer with a great deal of land. They were mostly employed by people who went into threshing as a business, or had sawmills or some other line that required portable power. Even before that time, I had the idea of making some kind of light steam car that would take the place of horses. More especially, however, as a tractor to attend to the excessive hard labor of plowing. It occurred to me, as I remember somewhat vaguely, that precisely the same idea might be applied to a carriage or a wagon on the road. A horseless carriage was a common idea. People had been talking about carriages without horses for many years back, in fact, ever since the steam engine was invented. But the idea of the carriage at first did not seem so practical to me as the idea of an engine to do the harder farm work. And of all the work on the farm, plowing was the hardest. Our roads were poor, and we had not the habit of getting around. One of the most remarkable features of the automobile on the farm is the way that it has broadened the farmer's life. We simply took for granted that unless the errand were urgent, we would not go to town. And I think that we rarely made more than a trip a week. In bad weather, we did not even go that often. Being a full-fledged machinist, and with a very fair workshop on the farm, it was not difficult for me to build a steam wagon or tractor. In the building of it came the idea that perhaps it might be made for road use. I felt perfectly certain that horses, considering all the bother of attending them and the expense of feeding, did not earn their keep. The obvious thing to do was design and build a steam engine that would be light enough to run an ordinary wagon or pull a plow. I thought it more important first to develop the tractor. 
to let farm drudgery off flesh and blood, and lay it on steel and motors has been my most constant ambition. It was circumstances that took me first into the actual manufacture of road cars. I found eventually that people were more interested in something that would travel on the road than in something that would do the work on the farms. In fact, I doubt that the light farm tractor could have been introduced on the farm had not the farmer had his eyes opened slowly but surely to the automobile. But that's getting ahead of the story. I thought the farmer would be more interested in the tractor. I built a steam car that ran. It had a kerosene heated boiler, and it developed plenty of power and a neat control, which is so easy with a steam throttle. But the boiler was dangerous. To get the requisite power without too big and heavy a power plant required, the engine would work under high pressure. Sitting on a high pressure steam boiler is not altogether pleasant. To make it even reasonably safe required an excess of weight that nullified the economy of high pressure. For two years I kept experimenting with various sorts of boilers. The engine and control problems were simple enough. And then I definitely abandoned the whole idea of running a road vehicle by steam. I knew that in England they had what amounted to locomotives running on the roads hauling lines of trailers and also there was no difficulty in designing a big steam tractor for use on a large farm. But ours were not then English roads. They would have stalled or racked to pieces the strongest and heaviest road tractor. And anyways, the manufacturing of a big tractor which only a few wealthy farmers could buy did not seem to me worthwhile. But I did not give up on the idea of a horseless carriage. The work with the Westinghouse representative only served to confirm the opinion I had formed that steam was not suitable for light vehicles. That is why I stayed only a year with that company. There was nothing more that the big steam tractors and engines could teach me, and I did not want to waste time on something that would lead nowhere. A few years before, it was while I was an apprentice. I read in The World of Science, an English publication, of the silent gas engine which was coming out of England. I think it was the auto engine. It ran with illuminating gas, had a single large cylinder, and the power impulses being thus intermittent required an extremely heavy flywheel. As far as weight was concerned, it gave nothing like the power per pound of metal that a steam engine gave, and the use of illuminating gas seemed to dismiss it as even a possibility for road use. It was interesting to me, only as all machinery was interesting. I followed in the English and American magazines, which we got in the shop, the development of the engine, and most particularly the hints of the possible replacement of the illuminating gas fuel by a gas formed by the vaporization of the gasoline. The idea of gas engines was by no means new, but this was the first time that a really serious effort has been made to put them on the market. They were received with interest rather than enthusiasm, and I do not recall any one who thought that the internal combustion engine could ever have more than a limited use. All the wise people demonstrated conclusively that the engine could not compete with steam. They never thought that it might carve out a career for itself. That is the way with wise people. They are so wise and practical that they always know to a dot just why something cannot be done. They always know the limitations, and that is why I never employ an expert in full bloom. If I ever wanted to kill opposition by unfair means, I would endow the opposition with experts. They would have so much good advice that I could be sure they would do little work. The gas engine interested me, and I followed its progress, but only from curiosity, until about 1885 or 1886, when the steam engine being discarded as the motive power for carriage that I intended some day to build, I had to look around for another sort of motive power. In 1885, I repaired an auto engine at the Eagle Ironworks in Detroit. No one in town knew anything about them. There was a rumor that I did. Although I'd never been before in contact with one, I undertook and carried through the job. That gave me a chance to study the new engine at first hand, and in 1887, I built one on the auto four cycle model just to see if I understood the principles. Four cycle means that 
The piston traverses the cylinder four times to get one power impulse. The first stroke draws in the gas. The second compresses it. The third is the explosion or power stroke, while the fourth stroke exhausts the waste gas. The little model worked well enough. It had a one inch bore and a three inch stroke, operated with gasoline. And while it did not develop much power, it was slightly lighter in proportion than the engines being offered commercially. I gave it away later to a young man who wanted it for something or other, and whose name I've forgotten. It was eventually destroyed. That was the beginning of the work with the internal combustion engine. I was on the farm to which I had returned. More because I wanted to experiment than because I wanted to farm. And now, being an all-around machinist, I had a first-class workshop to replace the toy shop of earlier days. My father offered me 40 acres of timberland, provided I give up being a machinist. I agreed in a provisional way, for cutting the timber gave me a chance to get married. I fitted out a sawmill and a portable engine and started to cut up and saw up the timber on the tract. Some of that first lumber went into a cottage on my new farm, and in it we began our married life. It was not a big house, 31 square feet and only a story and a half high, but it was a comfortable place. I added to it my workshop, and when I was not cutting timber, I was working on the gas engines, learning what they were and how they acted. I read everything I could find, but the greatest knowledge came from the work. A gas engine is a mysterious sort of thing. It will not always go the way it should. You can imagine how those first engines acted. It was in 1890 that I began on a double cylinder engine. It was quite impractical to consider the single cylinder for transportation purposes. The flywheel had to be entirely too heavy. Between making the first four cycle engines of the autotype and the start on a double cylinder, I had made a great many experimental engines out of tubing. I fairly knew my way about. The double cylinder, I thought, could be applied to a road vehicle, and my original idea was to put it on a bicycle with a direct connection to the crankshaft and allowing for the rear wheel of the bicycle to act as a balance wheel. The speed was going to be varied only by the throttle. Now, I never carried out this plan because it soon became apparent that the engine, gasoline tank, and the various necessary controls would be entirely too heavy for a bicycle. The plan of the two opposed cylinders was that, while one would be delivering power, the other would be exhausting. This naturally would not require so heavy a flywheel to even the application of power. The work started in my shop on the farm. Then I was offered a job with the Detroit Electric Company as an engineer and machinist at $45 a month. I took it because, well, that was more money than the farm was bringing me, and I had decided to get away from farm life anyway. The timber had all been cut. We rented a house on Bagley Avenue in Detroit. The workshop came along, and I set up a brick shed at the back of the house. During the first several months, I was in the night shift at the electric light plant, which gave me very little time for experimenting. But after that, I was in the day shift, and every night, and all of every Saturday night, I worked on the new motor. I cannot say that it was hard work. No work with interest is ever hard. I'm always certain of the results. They always come if you work hard enough. But it was a very great thing to have my wife even more confident than I was. She has always been that way. I had to work from the ground up. That is, although I knew that a number of people were working on horseless carriages, I could not know what they were doing. The hardest problems to overcome were in the making and breaking of the spark and in the avoidance of excess weight. For the transmission, the steering gear, and the general construction, I could draw on my experience with the steam tractors. In 1892, I completed my first motor car, but it was not until the spring of the following year that it ran to my satisfaction. This first car had something of the appearance of a buggy. There were two cylinders with a two and a half inch bore and a six inch stroke set side by side and over the rear axle. I made them out of the exhaust pipe of the engine that I had bought. They developed about four horsepower. The power was transmitted from the motor to the countershaft by a belt and from the countershaft to the rear wheel by a chain. The car would hold two people, the seat being suspended on posts 
and the body on elliptical springs. There were two speeds, one of 10 and the other of 20 miles per hour. Obtained by shifting the belt, which was done by a clutch lever in front of the driving seat. Thrown forward, the lever put in the high speed. Thrown back, the low speed. With the lever upright, the engine could run free. To start the car, it was necessary to turn the motor over by hand with the clutch free. To stop the car, one simply released the clutch and applied the foot brake. There was no reverse, and speeds, other than those of the belt, were obtained by the throttle. I bought the ironwork for the frame of the carriage, and also the seat and the springs. The wheels were 28-inch wire bicycle wheels with rubber tires. A balance wheel I'd cast from a pattern that I'd made, and all the more delicate mechanism I made myself. One of the features that I discovered was necessary was a compensating gear that permitted the same power to be applied to each of the rear wheels when turning corners. The machine altogether weighed about 500 pounds. A tank under the seat held three gallons of gasoline, which was fed to the motor through a small pipe and a mixing valve. The ignition was by electric spark. The original machine was air-cooled, or to be more accurate, the motor simply was not cooled at all. I found that on a run of an hour or more, the motor heated up, and so very shortly I put a water jacket around the cylinders and piped it to a tank in the rear of the car over the cylinders. Nearly all of these various features had been planned in advance. That is the way I've always worked. I draw a plan and work out every detail on the plan before starting the build. For otherwise, one will waste a great deal of time in makeshifts as the work goes on and the article will not have coherence. It will not be rightly proportioned. Many inventors fail because they do not distinguish between planning, and experimenting. The largest building difficulties that I had were in obtaining the proper materials. The next were with tools. There had to be some adjustments and changes in details of the design, but what held me up most was that I had neither the time nor the money to search for the best material for each part. But in the spring of 1893, the machine was running to my partial satisfaction and giving an opportunity further to test out the design and material on the road. Chapter 2 What I Learned About Business My a gasoline buggy was the first, and for a long time, the only automobile in Detroit. It was considered to be something of a nuisance, for it made a racket and it scared horses, and also it blocked traffic. For if I stopped my machine anywhere in town, a crowd was around it before I could start it up again. If I left it alone for even a minute, some inquisitive person always tried to run it. Finally, I had to carry a chain, and chain it to a lamppost whenever I left anywhere. And then, there was trouble with the police. I do not know quite why, for my impression is that there were no speed limit laws in those days. Anyways, I had to get a special permit from the mayor, and thus for a time enjoyed the distinction of being the only licensed chauffeur in America. I ran that machine about 1,000 miles through 1895 and 1896, and then sold it to Charles Ainsley of Detroit for $200. That was my first sale. I had built the car not to sell, but only to experiment with. I wanted to start another car. Ainsley wanted to buy. I could use the money, and we had no trouble in agreeing upon a price. It was not at all my idea to make cars in any such petty fashion. I was looking ahead to production, but before that could come, I had to have something to produce. It does not pay to hurry. I started a second car in 1896. It was much like the first, but a little lighter. It also had the belt drive, which I did not give up until some time later. The belts were all right, excepting in hot weather. That is why I later adopted gears. I learned a great deal from that car. Others in this country and abroad were building cars by that time. And in 1895, I heard that a Benz car from Germany was on exhibition in Macy's store in New York. I traveled down to look at it, but it had no features that seemed worthwhile. It also had the belt drive, 
but it was much heavier than my car. I was looking for lightness. The foreign makers have never seemed to appreciate what lightweight means. I built three cars in all in my shop, and all of them ran for years in Detroit. I still have the first car. I bought it back a few years later from a man to whom Mr. Ainsley had sold it. I paid $100 for it. During all this time, I kept my position with the electric company and gradually advanced chief engineer at a salary of $125 a month. But my gas engine experiments were no more popular with the president of the company than my first mechanical learnings were with my father. It was not that my employer objected to experiments, only to experiments with a gas engine. I can still hear him say, Electricity, yes. That's the coming thing. But gas, no. He had ample grounds for his skepticism, to use the mildest terms. Practically no one had the remotest notion of the future of the internal combustion engine, while we were just on the edge of the great electrical development. As with every comparatively new idea, electricity was expected to do much more than we even now have any indication that it can do. I did not see the use of experimenting with electricity for my purposes. A road car could not run on a trolley, even if trolley wires had been less expensive. No storage battery was in sight of a weight that was practical. An electrical car had of necessity to be limited in radius and to contain a large amount of motive machinery in proportion to the power exerted. That is not to say that I held or now hold electricity cheaply. We have not yet begun to use electricity, but it has its place. And the internal combustion engine has its place. Neither can substitute for the other, which is exceedingly fortunate. I have the dynamo that I first had charge of at the Detroit Edison Company. When I started our Canadian plant, I bought it from an office building, to which it had been sold by the electric company. Had it revamped a little, and for several years, it gave excellent service in the Canadian plant. When we had to build a new power plant, owing to the increase in business, I had the old motor taken out to my museum a room out at Dearborn that holds a great number of my mechanical treasures. The Edison Company offered me the general superintendency of the company, but only on the condition that I would give up my gas engine and devote myself to something really useful. I had to choose between my job and my automobile. I chose the automobile, or rather I gave up the job. There was really nothing in the way of a choice, for already I knew that the car was bound to be a success. I quit my job on August 15th of 1899 and went into the automobile business. It might be thought something of a step, for I had no personal funds. What money was left over from living was all used in experimenting. But my wife agreed that the automobile could not be given up, that we had to make or break. There was no demand for automobiles. There never is for a new article. They were accepted in much the fashion as was more recently the airplane. At first, the horseless carriage was considered merely a freak notion, and many wise people explained with particularity why it could never be more than a toy. No man of money even thought of it as a commercial possibility. I cannot imagine why each new means of transportation meets with such opposition. There are even those today who shake their heads and talk about the luxury of the automobile and only grudgingly admit that perhaps the motor truck is of some use. But in the beginning, there was hardly anyone who sensed that the automobile could be a large factor in industry. The most optimistic hoped only for a development akin to that of the bicycle. When it was found out that an automobile really could go and several makers started to put out cars, the immediate query was as to which would go fastest. It was a curious but natural development, that racing idea. I never thought anything of racing, but the public refused to consider the automobile in any light other than as a fast toy. Therefore, later, we had to race. The industry was held back by this initial racing slant, 
for the attention of the makers was diverted to making fast rather than good cars. It was a business for speculators. A group of men of speculative turn of mind organized as soon as I left the electric company, the Detroit Automobile Company, to exploit my car. I was the chief engineer and held a small amount of the stock. For three years we continued making cars more or less on the model of my first car. We sold very few of them. I could get no support at all towards making better cars to be sold to the public at large. The whole thought was to make to order and to get the largest price possible for each car. The main idea seemed to be to get the money. And being without authority other than my engineering position gave me, I found that the new company was not a vehicle for realizing my ideas, but merely a money-making concern that did not make much money. In March 1902, I resigned, determined never again to put myself under orders. The Detroit Automobile Company later became the Cadillac Company, under the ownership of the Lelands, who came in subsequently. I rented a shop, a one-story brick shed, at 81 Park Place to continue my experiments and to find out what business really was. I thought that it must be something different from what it had proved to be in my first adventure. The year from 1902 until the formation of the Ford Motor Company was practically one of investigation. In my little one-room brick shop, I worked on the development of a four-cylinder motor and on the outside I tried to find out what business really was, and whether it needed to be quite so selfish a scramble for money as it seemed to be from my first short experience. From the period of the first car, which I have described, until the formation of my present company, I built in all about 25 cars, of which 19 or 20 were built with the Detroit Automobile Company. The automobile had passed from the initial stage where the fact that it could run at all was enough to the stage where it had to show speed. Alexander Winton of Cleveland, the founder of the Winton car, was then the track champion of the country and willing to meet all comers. I designed a two-cylinder enclosed engine of a more compact type than I had used before, fitted it into a skeleton chassis, found that I could make speed and arranged a race with Winton. We met on the Gross Point track at Detroit. I beat him. That was my first race, and it brought advertising of the only kind that people cared to read. The public thought nothing of a car unless it made speed, unless it beat other racing cars. My ambition to build the fastest car in the world led me to plan a four-cylinder motor, but of that more later. The most surprising feature of business as it was conducted was the large attention given to finance and the small attention to service. That seemed to me to be reversing the natural process, which is that the money should come as a result of the work and not before the work. The second feature was the general indifference to better methods of manufacture, as long as whatever was done got by and took the money. In other words, an article apparently was not built with reference to how greatly it could serve the public, but with reference solely to how much money could be had for it. And that was without any particular care whether the customer was satisfied. To sell him was enough. A dissatisfied customer was regarded not as a man whose trust had been violated, but either as a nuisance or as a possible source of more money in fixing up the work which ought to have been done correctly in the first place. For instance, in automobiles there was not much concern as to what happened to the car once it had been sold. How much gasoline it used per mile was of no great moment. How much service it actually gave did not matter. And if it broke down and had to have parts replaced, then that was just hard luck for the owner. It was considered good business to sell parts at the highest possible price on the theory that since the man had already bought the car, he simply had to have the part and would be willing to pay for it. The automobile business was not on what I would call an honest basis to say nothing of being from a manufacturing standpoint, on a scientific basis, but it was no worse than business in general.
That was the period, it may be remembered, in which many corporations were being floated and financed. The bankers, who before then had confined themselves to the railroads, got into industry. My idea was then, and still is, that if a man did his work well, the price he would get for that work, the profits, and all financial matters, would care for themselves, and that a business ought to start small, and build itself up, and out of its earnings. If there are no earnings, then that is a signal to the owner that he is wasting his time, and does not belong in that business. I have never found it necessary to change those ideas, but I discovered that this simple formula of doing good work and getting paid for it was supposed to be slow for modern business. The plan at the time, most in favor, was to start off with the largest possible capitalization and then sell all the stock and all the bonds that could be sold. Whatever money happened to be left over after all that stock and bond selling expenses and promoters, charges, and all that went grudgingly into the foundation of the business. A good business was not one that did good work and earned a fair profit. A good business was one that would give the opportunity for the floating of a large amount of stocks and bonds at high prices. It was the stocks and bonds, not the work, that mattered. I could not see how a new business or an old business could be expected to be able to charge into its product a great big bond interest and then sell the product at a fair price. I've never been able to see that. I've never been able to understand on what theory the original investment of money can be charged against a business. Those men in business who call themselves financiers say that money is worth 6% or 5% or some other percent, and that if a business has $100,000 invested in it, the man who made the investment is entitled to charge an interest payment on the money, because if instead of putting that money into the business, he had put it into a savings bank or into certain securities, he could have a certain fixed return. Therefore, they say that a proper charge against the operating expenses of a business is the interest on this money. This idea is at the root of many business failures and most service failures. Money is not worth a particular amount. As money, it is not worth anything, for it will do nothing of itself. The only use of money is to buy tools to work with, or the product of tools. Therefore, money is worth what it will help you to produce, or buy, and no more. If a man thinks that his money will earn 5% or 6%, he ought to place it where he can get that return. But money placed in a business is not a charge on the business, or rather, should not be. It ceases to be money and becomes, or should become, an engine of production, and it is therefore worth what it produces, and not a fixed sum according to some scale that has no bearing upon the particular business in which the money has been placed. Any return should come after it has produced not before. Businessmen believed that you could do anything by financing it. If it did not go through on the first financing, then the idea was to refinance. The product of refinancing was simply the game of sending good money after bad. In the majority of cases, the need of refinancing arises from bad management and the effect of refinancing is simply to pay the poor managers to keep up their bad management a little longer. It is merely a postponement of the Day of Judgment. This makeshift of refinancing is a device of speculative financiers. Their money is no good to them unless they can connect it up with a place where real work is being done, and that they cannot do unless somehow that place is poorly managed. Thus, the speculative financiers delude themselves that they are putting their money out to use. They are not. They are putting it to waste. I determined absolutely that I would never join a company in which finance came before the work, or in which bankers or financiers had a part. And further that, if there were no way to get started in the kind of business that I thought could be managed in the interest of the public, 
and I simply would not get started at all. From my own short experience, together with what I saw going on around me, was quite enough proof that business as a mere money-making game was not worth giving much thought to, and was distinctly no place for a man who wanted to accomplish anything. Also, it did not seem to me to be the way to make money. I have yet to have it demonstrated that it is the way, for the only foundation of a real business is service. A manufacturer is not through with his customer when a sale is completed. He has then only started with his customer. In the case of an automobile, the sale of the machine is only something in the nature of an introduction. If the machine does not give service, then it is better for the manufacturer if he had never had the introduction, for he will have the worst of all advertisements, a dissatisfied customer. There was something more than a tendency in the early days of the automobile to regard the selling of a machine as the real accomplishment, and thereafter it did not matter what happened to the buyer. That is the short-sighted salesman on commission attitude. If a salesman is paid only for what he sells, it is not to be expected that he is going to exert any great effort on a customer out of whom no more commission is to be made. And it is right on this point that we later made the largest selling argument for the Ford. The price and the quality of the car would undoubtedly have made a market, and a large market. We went beyond that. A man who bought one of our cars was, in my opinion, entitled to the continuous use of that car. And therefore, if he had a breakdown of any kind, it was our duty to see that his machine was put into shape again at the earliest possible moment. And the success of the Ford car, the early provision of service, was an outstanding element. Most of the expensive cars of that period were ill-provided with service stations. If your car broke down, you had to depend on the local repairman, when you were entitled to depend upon the manufacturer. If the local repairman were a forehand sort of a person, keeping on hand a good stock of parts, although on many of the cars the parts were not interchangeable, the owner was lucky, but if the repairman were a shiftless person with an inadequate knowledge of the automobiles and an inordinate desire to make a good thing out of every car that came into his place for repairs, then even the slight breakdown meant weeks of laying up and whopping a big repair bill that had to be paid before the car could be taken away. The repairmen were, for a time, the largest menace to the automobile industry. Even as late as 1910 and 1911, the owner of an automobile was regarded as essentially a rich man whose money ought to be taken away from him. We met that situation squarely in, at the very beginning. We would not have our distribution blocked by stupid greedy men. That is getting some years ahead of the story, but it is control by finance that breaks up service because it looks to the immediate dollar. If the first consideration is to earn a certain amount of money, then, unless by some stroke of luck, matters are going especially well. And there is a surplus over for service, so that the operating men may have a chance. Future business has to be sacrificed for the dollar of today. And also I noticed the tendency among many men in business to feel that their lot was hard. They worked against a day when they might retire and live on an income, get out of the strife. Life to them was a battle to be ended as soon as possible. That was another point I could not understand. For, as I reasoned, life is not a battle except with our own tendency to sag with the downpool of getting settled. If to petrify is success, all one has to do is humor the lazy side of the mind. But if to grow is success, then one must wake up anew every morning and keep awake all day. I saw great businesses become but the ghost of a name, because someone thought they could be managed just as if they were always managed, and thought that management may have been most excellent in its day. Its excellence consisted in its alertness to its day, and not in slavish following of its yesterdays. Life as I see it is not a location, but a journey. Even the man who feels himself settled is not settled. He is probably sagging back. Everything is in flux, and was meant to be. Life flows.
We may live at the same number of the street, but it is never the same man who lives there. And out of the delusion that life is a battle that may be lost by a false move grows, I've noticed a great love for regularity. Men fall into the half-alive habit. Seldom does the cobbler take up with the new fangled way of soling shoes, and seldom does the artisan willingly take up with new methods in his trade. Habit conduces to a certain inertia, and any disturbance of it affects the mind like trouble. It will be recalled that when a study was made of shop methods, so that the workmen might be taught to produce with less useless motion and fatigue, it was most opposed by the workmen themselves, though they suspected that it was simply a game to get more out of them, what most irked them was that it interfered with the well-worn grooves in which they had become accustomed to move. Businessmen go down with their businesses because they like the old way so well that they cannot bring themselves to change. One sees them all about, men who do not know that yesterday is past and who woke up this morning with their last year's ideas. It could almost be written down as a formula that when a man begins to think that he has, at last, found his method, he had better begin at most searching examination of himself to see whether some part of his brain has not gone to sleep. There is a subtle danger in a man thinking that he is fixed for life. It indicates that the next jolt of the wheel of progress is going to fling him off. There is also a great fear of being thought a fool. So many men are afraid of being considered fools. I grant that public opinion is a powerful police influence for those who need it. Perhaps it is true that the majority of men need the restraint of public opinion. Public opinion may keep a man better than he would otherwise be, if not better morally, at least better as far as his social desirability is concerned. But. It is not a bad thing to be a fool for righteousness' sake. The best of it is that such fools usually live long enough to prove that they were not fools, or the work that they have begun lives long enough to prove that they were not foolish. The money influence, the pressing to make profit on an investment, and its consequent neglect of or skimping of work, and hence of service, showed itself to me in many ways. It seemed to be at the bottom of most troubles. It was the cause of low wages, for without well-directed work, high wages cannot be paid. And if the whole attention is not given to the work, it cannot be well-directed. Most men want to be free to work. Under the system in use, they could not be free to work. During my first experience, I was not free. I could not give full play to my ideas. Everything had to be planned to make money. The last consideration was the work. And the most curious part of it all was the insistence that it was the money and not the work that counted. It did not seem to strike anyone as illogical that money should be put ahead of work. Even though everyone had to admit that the profit had to come from the work, the desire seemed to be to find a shortcut to money, and to pass over the obvious shortcut, which is through the work. Take competition. I found that competition was supposed to be a menace, and that a good manager circumvented his competitors by getting a monopoly through artificial means. The idea was that there were only a certain number of people who could buy and that it was necessary to get their trade ahead of someone else. Someone will remember that later, many of the automobile manufacturers entered into an association under the Selden patent, just so that it might be legally possible to control the price and the output of automobiles. They had the same idea that so many trade unions have, the ridiculous notion that more profit can be had doing less work than more. The plan, I believe, is a very antiquated one. I could not see then, and am still unable to see, that there is not always enough for the man who does his work. Time spent 
in fighting competition is wasted. It had better be spent in doing the work. There are always enough people ready and anxious to buy, provided you supply what they want at the proper price. And this applies to personal services as well as to goods. During this time of reflection, I was far from idle. We were going ahead with a four-cylinder motor and the building of a pair of big racing cars. I had plenty of time, for I had never left my business. I do not believe a man can ever leave his business. He ought to think of it by day and dream of it by night. It is nice to plan to do one's work in office hours, to take up the work in the morning, to drop it off in the evening, and not have a care until the next morning. It is perfectly possible to do that if one is so constituted as to be willing through all of his life to accept direction, to be an employee, possibly a responsible employee, but not a director or manager of anything. A manual laborer must have a limit on his hours, otherwise he will wear himself out. If he intends to remain always a manual laborer, then he should forget about his work when the whistle blows. But if he intends to go forward and do anything, the whistle is only a signal to start thinking over the day's work in order to discover how it might be done better. The man who has the largest capacity for work and thought is the man who is bound to succeed. I cannot pretend to say, because I do not know, whether the man who works always, who never leaves his business, who is absolutely intent upon getting ahead, and who therefore does get ahead, is happier than the man who keeps off his hours, for both his brain and his hands. It is not necessary for anyone to decide that question. A 10 horsepower engine will not pull as much as 20. A man who keeps his brain off his hours limits his horsepower. If he is satisfied to pull only the load that he has, well and good, that is his affair. But he must not complain if another who has increased his horsepower pulls more than he does. Leisure and work bring different results. A man wants leisure and gets it, and he has no cause to complain. But he cannot have both leisure and the results of work. Concretely, what I most realized about business in that year, and I have been learning more each year without finding it necessary to change my first conclusions, is this. Number one, that finance is given a place ahead of work and therefore tends to kill the work and destroy the fundamental of service. Number two, that thinking first of money instead of work brings on fear of failure, and this fear blocks every avenue of business. It makes man afraid of competition, of changing his methods, or of doing anything which might change his condition. Number three, that the way is clear for anyone who thinks first of service, of doing the work in the best possible way. Chapter 3 Starting the Real Business In the little brick shop at 81 Park Place, I had ample opportunity to work out the design and some of the methods of manufacture of a new car. Even if it were possible to organize the exact kind of corporation that I wanted, one in which doing the work well and suiting the public would be controlling factors, it became apparent that I never could produce a thoroughly good motor car that might be sold at a low price under the existing cut-and-dry manufacturing methods. Everybody knows that it is always possible to do a thing better the second time. I do not know why manufacturing should not at the time have generally recognized this as a basic fact, unless it might be that the manufacturers were in such a hurry to obtain something to sell that they did not take time for adequate preparation. Making to order, instead of making in volume, is I suppose a habit, a tradition, that is descended from the old handicraft days. Ask a hundred people how they want a particular article made, about eighty will not know. They'll leave it to you. Fifteen will think that they must say something, while five will really have preferences and reasons. The ninety-five made up of those who do not know and admit it, and the fifteen who do not know but do not admit it constitute a real market for any product. The five who want something special 
may or may not be able to pay the price for special work. If they have the price, they can get the work, but they constitute a special and limited market. Of the 95, perhaps 10 or 15 will pay a price for quality. Of those remaining, a number will buy solely on a price without regard to quality. Their numbers are thinning with each day. Buyers are learning how to buy. The majority will consider quality and buy the biggest dollar's worth of quality. If, therefore, you discover what will give this 95% of people the best all-around service and then arrange to manufacture at the very highest quality and sell at the very lowest price, you will be meeting a demand which is so large that it may be called universal. This is not standardizing. The use of the word standardizing is very apt to lead one into trouble, for it implies a certain freezing of design and method and usually works out so that the manufacturer selects whatever article he can the most easily make and sell at the highest profit. The public is not considered either in the design or in the price. The thought behind most standardization is to be able to make a larger profit. The result is that with the economies which are inevitable if you make only one thing, a larger and larger profit is continually being held by that manufacturer. His output also becomes larger. His facilities produce more. And before he knows it, his markets are overflowing with goods which will not sell. These goods will sell if the manufacturer would take a lower price for them. There is always buying power present. But that buying power will not always respond to reductions in price. If an article has been sold at too high a price, and then, because of stagnant business, the price is suddenly cut, the response is sometimes most disappointing. And for a very good reason. The public is wary. It thinks that the price cut is fake, and it sits around waiting for a real cut. We saw much of that last year. If, on the contrary, the economies of making are transferred at once to the price, and if it is well known that such is the policy of the manufacturer, the public will have confidence in him and will respond. They will trust him to give an honest value. So standardization may seem bad business unless it carries with it the plan of constantly reducing the price at which the article is sold. And the price has to be reduced. This is very important because of the manufacturing economies that have come about, and not because the falling demand by the public indicates that it is not satisfied with the price. The public should always be wondering how it is possible to give so much for the money. Standardization, to use the word as I understand it, is not just taking one's best-selling article and concentrating on it. It is planning day and night, and probably for years, first on something which will best suit the public, and then on how it should be made. The exact processes of manufacturing will develop of themselves. Then if we shift the manufacturing from the profit to the service basis, we shall have a real business in which the profits will be all that anyone could desire. All of this seems self-evident to me. It is the logical basis of any business that wants to serve 95% of the community. It is the logical way in which the community can serve itself. I cannot comprehend why all business does not go on this basis. All that has to be done in order to adopt it is to overcome the habit of grabbing at the nearest dollar as though it were the only dollar in the world. The habit has already to an extent been overcome. All the large and successful retail stores in this country are on the one price basis. The only further step required is to throw overboard the idea of pricing on what the traffic will bear, and instead to go to the common sense basis of pricing on what it costs to manufacture, and then reducing the cost of manufacture. If design of the product has been sufficiently studied, then changes in it will come very slowly. But changes in manufacturing processes will come very rapidly and wholly naturally. This has been our experience in everything we have undertaken. How naturally it has all come about, I shall later outline. The point that I wish to impress here is that it is impossible to get a product on which one may concentrate unless an unlimited amount of study is given beforehand. It is not just an afternoon's work. These ideas were forming with me during this year of experimenting. Most of the experimenting went into the building of racing cars. The idea in those days was that a first-class car ought to be a racer. 
I never really thought much of racing, but followed the bicycle idea. The manufacturers had the notions that winning a race on a track told the public something about the merits of the automobile, although I can hardly imagine any test that would tell less. But as others were doing it, I too had to do it. In 1903, with Tom Cooper, I built two cars solely for speed. They were quite alike. One we named the 999, and the other the Arrow. If an automobile were going to be known for speed, then I was going to make an automobile that would be known wherever speed was known. These were. I put in four great big cylinders, giving 80 HP, which up to that time had been unheard of. The roar of those cylinders alone was enough to half kill a man. There was only one seat. One life to a car was enough. I tried out the cars. Cooper tried out the cars. We lift them out at full speed. I cannot quite describe the sensation. Going over Niagara Falls would have been but a pastime after riding in one of them. I did not want to take the responsibility of racing the 999, which we put up first. Neither did Cooper. Cooper said he knew a man who lived on speed, that nothing could go too fast for him. He wired to Salt Lake City, and on came a professional bicycle rider named Barney Oldfield. He had never driven a motor car, but he liked the idea of trying it. He said he would try anything once. It took us only a week to teach him how to drive. The man did not know what fear was. All that he had to do was learn how to control the monster. Controlling the fastest car of today was nothing as compared to controlling that car. The steering wheel had not yet been thought of. All the previous cars that I had built simply had tillers. On this one, I put a two-handed tiller, for holding the car in line required all the strength of a strong man. The race for which we were working was at three miles on the Gross Point track. We kept our cars as a dark horse. We left the predictions to the others. The tracks then were not scientifically banked. It was not known how much speed a motor car could develop. No one knew better than Oldfield what the turns meant. And as he took his seat while I was cranking the car for the start, he remarked cheerily, Well, this chariot may kill me, but they will say afterward that I was going like hell when she took me over the bank. And he did go. He never dared to look around. He did not shut off on the curves. He simply let that car go. And go it did. He was about half a mile ahead of the next man at the end of the race. The 999 did what it was intended to do. It advertised the fact that I could build a fast motor car. A week after the race, I formed the Ford Motor Company. I was vice president, designer, master mechanic, superintendent, and general manager. The capitalization of the company was $100,000, and of this, I owned 25.5%. The total amount subscribed in cash was about $28,000, which is the only money that the company has ever received for the capital fund from other than operations. In the beginning, I thought that it was possible, notwithstanding my former experience, to go forward with a company in which I owned less than the controlling share. I very shortly found I had to have control, and therefore in 1906, with funds that I earned from the company, I bought enough stock to bring my holdings up to 51%, and little later, bought enough more to give me 58.5%. The new equipment and the whole progress of the company have always been financed out of earnings. In 1919, my son, Edsel, purchased the remaining 41.5% of the stock because certain of the minority stockholders disagreed with my policies. For these shares, he paid at the rate of $12,500 for each $100 par, and in all, paid about 75 millions. The original company and its equipment, as may be gathered, were not elaborate. We rented Strello's carpenter shop on Mac Avenue. In making my designs, I had also worked out the methods of making, but since at that time we could not afford to buy machinery, the entire car was made according to my designs, but by various manufacturers. 
and about all we did, even in the way of assembling, was to put on the wheels, the tires, and the body. That would really be the most economical method of manufacturing. If only one could be certain that all of the various parts would be made on the manufacturing plan that I have above outlined. The most economical manufacturing of the future will be that in which the whole of an article is not made under one roof, unless, of course, it be a very simple article. The modern, or better, the future method is to have each part made where it may be best made and then assemble the parts into a complete unit at the points of consumption. That is the method we are now following and expect to extend. It would make no difference whether one company or one individual owned all the factories fabricating the component parts of a single product, or whether such part were made in our independently owned factory. If only all adopted the same service methods. If we can buy as good a part as we can make ourselves, and the supply is ample and the price is right, we do not attempt to make it ourselves, or at any rate, to make more than an emergency supply. In fact, it might be better to have the ownership widely scattered. I had been experimenting principally upon the cutting down of weight. Excess weight kills any self-propelled vehicle. There are a lot of fool ideas about weight, it is queer, when you come to think of it, how some fool terms get into current use. There is a phrase, heavyweight, as applied to a man's mental apparatus. What does it mean? No one wants to be fat and heavy of body, then why of head? For some clumsy reason, we have come to confuse strength with weight. The crude methods of early building undoubtedly had much to do with this. The old ox cart weighed a ton, and it had so much weight that it was weak. To carry a few tons of humanity from New York to Chicago, the railroad builds a train that weighs many hundred tons, and the result is an absolute loss of real strength and the extravagant waste of untold millions in the form of power. The law of diminishing returns begins to operate at the point where strength becomes weight. Weight may be desirable in a steamroller, but nowhere else. Strength has nothing to do with weight. The mentality of the man who does things in the world is agile, light, and strong. The most beautiful things in the world are those from which all excess weight has been eliminated. Strength is never just weight, either in men or things. Whenever anyone suggests to me that I might increase weight or add a part, I look into decreasing the weight and eliminating a part. The car that I designed was lighter than any car that had yet been made. It would have been lighter if I had known how to make it so. Later, I got the materials to make the lighter car. In our first year, we built Model A, selling the runabout for $850 and the tonneau for $100 more. This model had a two-cylinder opposed motor, developing eight horsepower. It had a chain drive, a 72-inch wheelbase, which was supposed to be long, and a fuel capacity of five gallons. We made and sold 1,708 cars in the first year. That is how well the public responded. Every one of these Model A's has a history. Take number 420. Colonel D.C. Collier of California bought it in 1904. He used it for a couple of years, sold it, and bought a new Ford. Number 420 changed hands frequently until 1907, when it was bought by one Edmund Jacobs, living near Ramona in the heart of the mountains. He drove it for several years in the roughest kind of work, then, he bought a new Ford and sold his old one. By 1915, number 420 had passed into the hands of a man named Cantello, who took out the motor, hitched it to a water pump, rigged up the shafts on the chassis, and now, while the motor chugs away at the pumping of water, the chassis, drawn by a burrow, acts as a buggy. 
The moral, of course, is that you can dissect a Ford, but you cannot kill it. In our first advertisement, we said, and I quote, Our purpose is to construct and market an automobile specially designed for everyday wear and tear, business professional and family use. An automobile which will attain to a sufficient speed to satisfy the average person without acquiring any of those breakneck velocities which are so universally condemned. A machine which will be admired by man, woman, and child alike for its compactness, its simplicity, its safety, its all-around convenience, and last but not least, its exceedingly reasonable price, which places it within the reach of many thousands who could not think of paying the comparatively fabulous prices asked for most machines. And these are the points we emphasized. Good material. Simplicity. Most of the cars at the time required considerable skill in their management. The engine. The ignition, which was furnished by two sets of six dry cell batteries. The automatic oiling. The simplicity and the ease of control of the transmission, which was of the planetary type. The workmanship. We did not make the pleasure appeal. We never have. In its first advertising, we showed that a motor car was a utility. We said, and I yet again quote, We often hear quoted the old proverb, time is money, and yet how few business and professional men act as if they really believed its truth. Men who are constantly complaining of shortage of time and lamenting the fearness of the days in the week. Men to whom every five minutes wasted means a dollar thrown away. Men to whom five minutes delay sometimes means the loss of many dollars. Will yet depend on the haphazard, uncomfortable, and limited means of transportation afforded by streetcars and etc. When the investment of an exceedingly moderate sum in the purchase of a perfected, efficient, high-grade automobile would cut out anxiety and unpunctuality and provide a luxurious means of travel ever at your beck and call. Always ready, always sure. Built to save you time and consequent money. Built to take you anywhere you want to go and bring you back again on time. Built to add to your reputation for punctuality, to keep your customers good-humored and in a buying mood. Built for business or pleasure, just as you say. Built also for the good of your health, to carry you joylessly over any kind of half-decent roads, to refresh your brain for the luxury of much outdoorness, and your lungs with the tonic of tonics, the right kind of atmosphere. You can, if you choose, loiter lingeringly through shady avenues, or you can press down on the foot lever until all the scenery looks alike to you, and you have to keep your eyes skinned to count the milestones as they pass. I am giving the gist of this advertisement to show that from the beginning, we were looking to provide service. We never bothered with a sporting car. The business went along almost as by magic. The cars gained a reputation for standing up. They were tough, they were simple, and they were well made. I was working on my design for a universal single model, but I had not settled the designs, nor had we the money to build and equip the proper kind of plant for manufacturing. I had not the money to discover the very best and lightest materials. We still had to accept materials that the market offered. We got the best to be had, but we had no facilities for the scientific investigation of materials or for original research. My associates were not convinced that it was possible to restrict our cars to a single model. The automobile trade was following the old bicycle trade, in which every manufacturer thought it necessary to bring out a new model each year and to make it so unlike all previous models that those who had bought the former models would want to get rid of the old and buy the new. That was supposed to be good business. It is the same idea that women submit to in their clothing and hats. That is not service. It seeks only to provide something new, not something better. It is extraordinary how firmly rooted in the notion that business, continuous selling, 
depends on not satisfying the customer once and for all, but on first getting his money for one article and then persuading him he ought to buy a new and different one, the plan which I then had in the back of my head, but to which we were not then sufficiently advanced to give expression, was that when a model was settled upon, then every improvement on that model should be interchangeable with the old model, so that a car should never get out of date. It is my ambition to have every piece of machinery or other non-consumable product that I turn out so strong and so well made that no one ought to ever have to buy a second one. A good machine of any kind ought to last as long as a good watch. In the second year, we scattered our energies among three models. We made a four-cylinder touring car, Model B, which sold for $2,000, Model C, which was a slightly improved Model A, and sold at $50 more than the former price, and Model F, a touring car, which sold for $1,000. That is, we scattered our energy and increased prices, and therefore we sold fewer cars in that first year. The sales were 1,695 cars. That Model B, the first four-cylinder car for general road use, had to be advertised. Winning a race or making a record was then the best kind of advertising, so I fixed up the Aero, the twin of the old 999, in fact, practically remade it, and a week before the New York Automobile Show, I drove it myself over a surveyed mile, straight away on the ice. I shall never forget that race. The ice seemed smooth enough, so smooth that if I had called off the trial, we should have secured an immense amount of the wrong kind of advertising. But instead of being smooth, that ice was seamed with fissures, which I knew were going to mean trouble the moment I got up speed. But there was nothing to do but go through with the trial. I let the old arrow out. At every fissure, the car lipped into the air. I never knew how it was coming down. When I wasn't in the air, I was skidding. But somehow, I stayed top side up, and on the course, making a record that went all over the world. That put Model B on the map, but not enough on to overcome the price advances. No stunt and no advertising will sell an article for any length of time. Business is not a game. The moral is coming. Our little wooden shop had, with the business we were doing, become totally inadequate, and in 1906 we took out of our working capital sufficient funds to build a three-story plant at the corner of Piquette and Bobian Street, which for the first time gave us real manufacturing facilities. We began to make and assemble quite a number of the parts although still we were principally an assembling shop. In 1905 to 1906, we made only two models. One, the four-cylinder car at $2,000, and another touring car at $1,000, both being the models of the previous year, and our sales dropped to 1,599 cars. Some said it was because we had not brought out new models. I thought it was because our cars were too expensive, they did not appeal to the 95%. I changed the policy the next year, having first acquired stock control. For 1906 to 1907, we entirely left off making touring cars and made three models of runabouts and roadsters, none of which differed materially from the other in manufacturing process or in component parts, but were somewhat different in appearance. The big thing was that the cheapest car sold for $600, and the most expensive for only $750. And right there came the complete demonstration of what price meant. We sold 8,423 cars, nearly five times as many as in our biggest previous year. Our banner week was that of May 15, 1908, when we assembled 311 cars in six working days. It almost swamped our facilities. The foreman had a tally board on which he chalked up each car as it was finished and turned over to the testers. The tally board was hardly equal to the task. On one day in the following June, we assembled an even 100 cars. In the next year, we departed from the program that had been so successful and I designed a big car, 50 horsepower, six cylinder, 
that would burn up the roads. We continued making our small cars, but the 1907 panic and the diversion to the more expensive model cut down the sales to 6,398 cars. We had been through an experimenting period of five years. The cars were beginning to be sold in Europe, as an automobile business then went, was considered extraordinarily prosperous. We had plenty of money. Since the first year, we have practically always had plenty of money. We sold for cash. We did not borrow money. And we sold directly to the purchaser. We had no debts, and we kept within ourselves on every move. I've always kept well within my resources. I've never found it necessary to strain them, because inevitably, if you give attention to work and service, the resources will increase more rapidly than you can devise ways and means of disposing of them. We were careful in the selection of our salesmen. At first, there was a great difficulty in getting good salesmen because the automobile trade was not supposed to be stable. It was supposed to be dealing in the luxury and pleasure vehicles. We eventually appointed agents, selecting the very best men we could find and then paying to them a salary larger than they could possibly earn in business for themselves. In the beginning, we had not paid much in the way of salaries. We were feeling our way, but when we knew what our way was, we adopted the policy of paying the very highest reward for service and then insisting upon getting the highest service. Among the requirements for an agent, we laid down the following. 1. A progressive, up-to-date man keenly alive to the possibilities of business. 2. A suitable place of business, clean and dignified appearance. 3. A stock of parts sufficient to make prompt replacements and keep in active service every Ford car in his territory. 4. An adequately equipped repair shop, which has in it the right machinery for every necessary repair and adjustment. 5. Mechanics who are thoroughly familiar with the construction and operation of Ford cars. 6. A comprehensive bookkeeping system and a follow-up sales system, so that it may be instantly apparent what is the financial status of the various departments of his business, the condition and size of his stock, the present owners of cars, and the future prospects. 7. Absolute cleanliness throughout every department. There must be no unwashed windows, dusty furniture, or dusty floors. 8. A suitable display sign. 9. The adoption of policies which will ensure absolutely square dealing and the highest character of business ethics. And this is the general instruction that was issued. A dealer or a salesman ought to have the name of every possible automobile buyer in his territory, including all those who have ever given the matter a thought. He should then personally solicit a visitation, if possible, by correspondence at the least, every man on that list, and then, making necessary memoranda, know the automobile situation as related to every resident so solicited. If your territory is too large to permit this, you have too much territory. The way was not easy. We were harried by a big suit brought against the company to try and force us into line with an association of automobile manufacturers who were operating under the false principle that there was only a limited market for automobiles and that a monopoly of that market was essential. This was the famous Selden Patent suit. At times, the support of our defense severely strained our resources. Mr. Selden, who has but recently died, had little to do with the suit. It was the association which sought a monopoly under the patent. The situation was this. George B. Selden, a patent attorney, filed an application as far back as 1879 for a patent, the object of which was stated to be, quote, the production of a safe, simple, and cheap road locomotive, light in weight, easy to control, possessed of sufficient power to overcome an ordinary inclination, end quote. This application was kept alive in the patent office by methods which are perfectly legal until 1895, where the patent was granted. In 1879, when the application was filed, the automobile was practically unknown to the general public, but by the time the patent was issued, everybody was familiar with the self-propelled vehicles. 
and most of the men, including myself, who had been for years working on motor propulsion, were surprised to learn that what we had made practicable was covered by an application of years before. Although the applicant had kept his idea merely as an idea, he had done nothing to put it into practice. The specific claims under the patent were divided into six groups, and I think that not a single one of them was a really new idea even in 1879 when the application was filed. The patent office allowed a combination and a so-called combination patent deciding that the combination A of a carriage with its body machinery and steering wheel with the B propelling mechanism clutch and gear and finally C the engine made a valid patent. With all of that we were not concerned. I believed that my engine had nothing whatsoever in common with what Selden had in mind. A powerful combination of manufacturers who called themselves the licensed manufacturers because they operated under licenses from the patentee brought the suit against us as soon as we began to be a factor in motor production. The suit dragged on. It was intended to scare us out of business. We took volumes of testimony and the blow came on September 15, 1909, when Judge Huff rendered an opinion in the United States District Court, finding against us. Immediately, that licensed association began to advertise, warning prospective purchasers against our cars. They had done the same thing in 1903 at the start of the suit, when it was thought that we could be put out of business. I had implicit confidence that eventually we would win our suit, I simply knew that we were right, but it was a considerable blow to get the first decision against us, for we believed that many buyers, even though no injunction was issued against us, would be frightened away from buying because of the threats of court action against individual owners. The idea was spread that if the suit finally went against me, every man who owned a Ford car would be prosecuted. Some of my more enthusiastic opponents, I understand, gave it out privately that there would be criminal as well as civil suits and that a man buying a Ford car might as well be buying a ticket to jail. We answered with an advertisement for which we took four pages in the principal newspapers all over the country. We set our case, we set out our confidence in victory, and the conclusion said, as I quote, In conclusion, we beg to state if there are any prospective automobile buyers who are at all intimidated by the claims made by our adversaries that we will give them, in addition to the protection of the Ford Motor Company with its some six million dollars of assets, an individual bond backed by a company of more than six million dollars more of assets, so that each and every individual owner of a Ford car will be protected until at least $12 million of assets have been wiped out by those who desire to control and monopolize this wonderful industry. The bond is yours for the asking, so do not allow yourself to be sold inferior cars at extravagant prices because of any statement made by this divine body. NB. This fight is not being waged by the Ford Motor Company without the advice and counsel of the blessed patent attorneys of the East and West. We thought that the bond would give assurance to the buyers that they needed confidence. They did not. We sold more than 18,000 cars, nearly double the output of the previous year, and I think about 50 buyers asked for bonds. Perhaps it was less than that. As a matter of fact, probably nothing so well advertised the Ford car and the Ford Motor Company as did this suit. It appeared that we were the underdog, and we had the public's sympathy. The association had $70 million. We, at the beginning, did not half that number of thousands. I never had a doubt as to the outcome, but nevertheless, it was a sword hanging over our heads that we could as well do without. Prosecuting that suit was probably one of the most short-sighted acts that any group of American businessmen has ever combined to commit. Taken in all its sidelights, 
It forms the best possible example of joining unwittingly to kill a trade. I regard it as most unfortunate for automobile makers of the country that we eventually won, and the association ceased to be a serious factor in the business. By 1908, however, in spite of this suit, we had come to a point where it was possible to announce and put into fabrication the kind of car that I wanted to build. Chapter 4 The Secret of Manufacturing and Serving Now, I am not outlining the career of the Ford Motor Company for any personal reason. I'm not saying, go thou and do likewise. What I am trying to emphasize is that the ordinary way of doing business is not the best way. I am coming to the point of my entire departure from the ordinary methods. From this point dates the extraordinary success of the company. We had been fairly following the custom of the trade. Our automobile was less complex than any other. We had no outside money in the concern. But aside from these two points, we did not differ materially from the other automobile companies, excepting that we had been somewhat more successful and had rigidly pursued the policy of taking all cash discounts, putting our profits back into the business, and maintaining a large cash balance. We entered cars in all of the races. We advertised and we pushed our sales. Outside of the simplicity of the construction of the car, our main difference in design was that we made no provision for the purely pleasure car. We were just as much a pleasure car as any other car on the market, but we gave no attention to purely luxury features. We would do special work for a buyer, and I suppose that we would have made a special car at a price. We were a prosperous company. We might have easily sat down and said, Now we have arrived. Let us hold what we have got. Indeed, there was some disposition to take this stand. Some of the stockholders were seriously alarmed when our production reached 100 cars a day. They wanted to do something to stop me from ruining the company, and when I replied to the effect that 100 cars a day was only a trifle, and that I hoped before long to make a thousand a day, they were inexpressibly shocked, and I understand, seriously contemplated court action. If I had followed the general opinion of my associates, I should have kept the business about as it was, put our funds into a fine administration building, tried to make bargains with such competitors as seemed too active, made new designs from time to time to catch the fancy of the public, and generally have passed on into the position of a quiet, respectable citizen with a quiet, respectable business. The temptation to stop and hang on to what one has is quite natural. I can entirely sympathize with the desire to quit a life of activity and retire to a life of ease. I have never felt the urge myself, but I can comprehend what it is. Although, I think that a man who retires ought entirely to get out of a business. There is a disposition to retire and retain control. There was, however, no part of my plan to do anything of that sort. I regarded our progress merely as an invitation to do more, as an indication that we have reached a place where we might begin to perform a real service. I had been planning every day through these years towards a universal car. The public had given its reaction to the various models. The cars in service, the racing, and the road tests gave excellent guides as to the changes that ought to be made, and even by 1905, I had fairly in mind the specifications of the kind of car I wanted to build, but I lacked the material to give strength without weight. I came across that material almost by accident. In 1905, I was at a motor race at Palm Beach. There was a big smash-up and a French car was wrecked. We had entered our Model K, the high-powered 6. I thought the foreign cars had smaller and better parts than we knew anything about. After the wreck, I picked up a little valve strip stem. It was very light and very strong. I asked what it was made of. Nobody knew. I gave the stem to my assistant. Find out all about this, I told him. That is the kind of material we ought to have in our cars. He found eventually that it was a French steel and that there was vanadium in it. We tried every steel maker in America, 
not one could make vanadium steel. I sent to England for a man who understood how to make the steel commercially. The next thing was to get a plant to turn it out. There was another problem. Vanadium requires 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The ordinary furnace could not go beyond 2,700 degrees. I found a small steel company in Canton, Ohio. I offered to guarantee them against loss if they could run a heat for us. They agreed. The first heat was a failure. Very little vanadium remained in the steel. I had them try again, and the second time, the steel came through. Until then, we had been forced to be satisfied with steel running between 60,000 and 70,000 pounds tensile strength. With vanadium, the strength went up to 170,000 pounds. Having vanadium in hand, I pulled apart our models and tested in detail to determine what kind of steel was best for every part. Whether we wanted a hard steel, a tough steel, or an elastic steel. We, for the first time, I think, in the history of any large construction, determined scientifically the exact quality of the steel. As a result, we then selected 20 different types of steel for the various steel parts. About 10 of these were vanadium. Vanadium was used wherever strength and lightness were required. Of course, they are not all the same kind of vanadium steel. The other elements vary according to whether the part is to stand hardware or whether it needs spring. In short, according to what it needs. Before these experiments, I believe that not more than four different grades of steel had ever been used in automobile construction. By further experimenting, especially in the direction of heat treating, we have been able still further to increase the strength of the steel and therefore to reduce the weight of the car. In 1910, the French Department of Commerce and Industry took one of our steering spindle connecting rod yokes, selecting it as a vital unit, and tried it against a similar part from what they considered the best French car. And in every test, our steel proved the stronger. The vanadium steel disposed of much of the weight. The other requisites of a universal car I had already worked out, and many of them were in practice. The design had to balance. Men die because a part gives out. Machines wreck themselves because some parts are weaker than others. Therefore, a part of the problem in designing a universal car was to have, as nearly as possible, all parts of equal strength considering their purpose, to put a motor in a one-horse shay. Also, it had to be foolproof. This was difficult because a gasoline motor is essentially a delicate instrument and there is a wonderful opportunity for anyone who has a mind that way to mess it up. I adopted this slogan. When one of my cars breaks down, I know I am to blame. From the day the first motor car appeared on the streets, it had to me appeared to be a necessity. It was this knowledge and assurance that led me to build the one end, a car that would meet the wants of the multitudes. All my efforts were then, and still are, turned to the production of one car, one model. And year following year, the pressure was, and still is, to improve and refine and make better, with an increasing reduction in price. The universal car had to have these attributes. Number one, quality and material to give service and use. Vanadium steel is the strongest, toughest, and most lasting of steels. It forms the foundation and superstructure of the cars. It is the highest quality steel in this respect in the world, regardless of price. Number two, simplicity in operation, because the masses are not mechanics. Number three, power in sufficient quantity. Number four, absolute reliability, because of the varied uses to which the cars would be put and the variety of roads over which they would travel. Number five, lightness. With the Ford, there are only 7.95 pounds to be carried by each cubic inch of piston displacement. This is one of the reasons why Ford cars are, quote, always going, wherever and whenever you see them. Through sand and mud, through slush, snow, and water, up hills, across fields, and roadless plains. Number six, control. To hold its speed always in hand, calmly and safely meeting every emergency and contingency, either in the crowded streets of the city or on dangerous roads. The planetary transmission of Ford gave this control, and anybody could work it. 
That is the why of the saying, anybody can drive a Ford. It can turn around almost anywhere. Number seven, the more a motor car weighs, naturally, the more fuel and lubricants are used in the driving. The lighter the weight, the lighter the expense of operation. The light weight of the Ford car in its early years was used as an argument against it. Now, that is all changed. The design which I settled upon was called the Model T. The important feature of the model, which, if it were accepted as I thought it would be, I intended to make the only model and then start into real production, was its simplicity. There were but four constructional units in the car. The power plant, the frame, the front axle, and the rear axle. All of these were easily accessible, and they were designed so that no special skill would be required for the repair or replacement. I believed then, although I said very little about it because of the novelty of the idea, that it ought to be possible to have parts so simple and so inexpensive that the menace of expensive hand repair work would be entirely eliminated. The parts could be made so cheaply that it would be less expensive to buy new ones than to have old ones repaired. They could be carried in hardware shops, just as nails or bolts are carried. I thought that it was up to me, as the designer, to make the car so completely simple that no one could fail to understand it. That works both ways, and applies to everything. The less complex an article, the easier it is to make. The cheaper it may be sold, and therefore, the greater number may be sold. It is not necessary to go into the technical details of the construction, but perhaps this is a good place as any to review the various models, because Model T was the last of the models, and the policy which it brought about took this business out of the ordinary line of business. Application of the same idea would take any business out of the ordinary run. I designed eight models in all before Model T. They were Model A, Model B, Model C, Model F, Model N, Model R, Model S, and Model K. Of these, models A, C, and F had two-cylinder opposed horizontal motors. In model A, the motor was at the rear of the driver's seat. In all of the other models, it was in a front hood. Models B, N, R, and S had motors of the four-cylinder vertical type. Model K had six cylinders. Model A developed 8 horsepower, Model B developed 24 horsepower with a 4.5 inch cylinder and a 5 inch stroke. The highest horsepower was in Model K, the 6 cylinder car, which developed 40 horsepower. The largest cylinders were those of Model B. The smallest were in Models N, R, and S, which were 3 and 3 fourths inches in diameter with a 3 and 3 eighths inch stroke. Model T has a 3 and 3 fourths inch cylinder with a 4 inch stroke. The ignition was by dry batteries in all excepting Model B, which had storage batteries, and in Model K, which had both battery and magneto. In the present model, the magneto is a part of the power plant and is built in. The clutch in the first four models was of the cone type. In the last four, and in the present model, of the multiple disc type. The transmission in all of the cars has been planetary. Model A had a chain drive. Model B had a shaft drive. The next two models had chain drives. Since then, all of the cars have had shaft drives. Model A had a 72 inch wheelbase. Model B, which was an extremely good car, had 92 inches. Model K had 120 inches. Model C had 78 inches. The others had 84 inches, and the present car has 100 inches. In the first five models, all of the equipment was extra. The next three were sold with a partial equipment. The present car is sold with the full equipment. Model A weighed 1,250 pounds. The lightest cars were models N and R. They weighed 1,050 pounds. But they were both runabouts. The heaviest car was the six-cylinder which weighed 2,000 pounds. The present car weighs 1,200 pounds. The Model T had practically no features which were not contained in some one or other of the previous models. Every detail had been fully tested in practice. There was no guessing as to whether or not it would be a successful model. 
It had to be. There was no way it could escape being so, for it had not been made in a day. It contained all that I was then able to put into a motor car, plus the material, which for the first time I was able to obtain. We put out Model T for the season 1908 through 1909. The company was then five years old. The original factory space had been 0.28 acres. We had employed an average of 311 people in the first year, built 1,708 cars, and had one branch house. In 1908, the factory space had increased to 2.65 acres, and we owned the building. The average number of employees had increased to 1,908. We built 6,181 cars and had 14 branch houses. It was a prosperous business. During the season 1908 through 1909, we continued to make models R and S, four-cylinder runabouts and roadsters, the models that had previously been so successful and which sold at $700 and $750. But Model T swept them right out. We sold 10,607 cars, a larger number than any manufacturer had ever sold. The price for the touring car was $850. On the same chassis, we mounted a town car at $1,000, a roadster at $825, a coupe at $950, and a landaulet at $950. This season demonstrated conclusively to me that it was time to put the new policy in force. The salesmen before I had announced the policy were spurred by the great sales to think that even greater sales might be had, if only we had more models. It is strange how, just as soon as an article becomes successful, somebody starts to think that it would be more successful if only it were different. There is a tendency to keep monkeying with styles and to spoil a good thing by changing it. The salesmen were insistent on creating the line. They insisted, to the 5%, the special customers who could say what they wanted, they listened to the 5%, the special customers who could say what they wanted, and forgot all about the 95% who just bought without making any fuss. No business can improve unless it pays the closest possible attention to complaints and suggestions. If there is any defect in service, then that must be instantly and rigorously investigated. But when the suggestion is only as to style, one has to make sure whether it is not merely a personal whim that is being voiced. Salesmen always want to cater to whims instead of acquiring sufficient knowledge of their product to be able to explain to the customer with the whim that what they have will satisfy his every requirement. That is, of course, provided what they have does satisfy these requirements. Therefore, in 1909, I announced one morning without any previous warning that in the future we were going to build only one model, that the model was going to be the Model T and that the chassis would be exactly the same for all cars. And I remarked, Any customer can have a car painted any color that he wants, so long as it is black. I cannot say that anyone agreed with me. The selling people could not, of course, see the advantages that a single model would bring about in production. More than that, they did not particularly care. They thought that our production was good enough as it was, and there was a very decided opinion that lowering the sales price would hurt sales, and the people who wanted quality would be driven away, and that there would be none to replace them. There was very little conception of the motor industry. A motor car was still regarded as something in the way of a luxury. The manufacturers did a good deal to spread this idea. Some clever persons invented the name Pleasure Car, and the advertising emphasized the pleasure features. The salespeople had ground for their objections, and particularly when I made the following announcement. I will build a motor car for the great multitude. It will be large enough for the family, but small enough for the individual to run and care for. It will be constructed of the best materials by the best men to be hired. 
after the simplest designs that modern engineering can devise. But it will be so low price that no man making a good salary will be unable to own one and enjoy with his family the blessings of hours of pleasure in God's great open spaces. This announcement was received not with pleasure. The general comment was, if Ford does that, he will be out of business in six months. The impression was that a good car could not be built at a low price, and that anyhow, there was no use in building a low-priced car, because only wealthy people were in the market for cars. The 1908-1909 sales of more than 10,000 cars had convinced me that we needed a new factory. We already had a big modern factory, the Pickett Street plant. It was as good as, perhaps a little better than, any automobile factory in the country. But I did not see how it was going to care for the sales and production that were inevitable. So I bought 60 acres at Highland Park which was then considered a way out in the country from Detroit. The amount of ground bought and the plans for a bigger factory than the world has ever seen were opposed. The question was already being asked. How soon will Ford blow up? Nobody knows how many thousands of times it has been asked since. It is asked only because of the failure to grasp that a principle rather than an individual is at work and the principle is so simple that it seems mysterious. For 1909 to 1910, in order to pay for the new land and buildings, I slightly raised the prices. This is perfectly justifiable, and results in a benefit, not an injury, to the purchaser. I did exactly the same thing a few years ago, or rather, in that case, I did not lower the price, as is my annual custom in order to build the River Rouge plant. The extra money might in each case have been had by borrowing, but then we should have had a continuing charge upon the business, and all subsequent cars would have had to bear this charge. The price of all the models was increased $100, with the exception of the Roadster, which was increased only $75, and of the Landolet and Town Car, which were increased $150 and $200, respectively. We sold 18,664 cars. And then for 1910 to 1911, with the new facilities, I cut the touring car from $950 to $780, and we sold 34,528 cars. That is the beginning of the steady reduction in the price of the cars in the face of ever-increasing costs of materials and ever higher wages. Contrast the year 1908 with the year 1911. The factory space increased from 2.65 acres to 32 acres. The average number of employees from 1,908 to 4,110. And the cars built from a little over 6,000 to nearly 35,000. You will note that men were not employed in proportion to the output. We were, almost overnight it seems, in great production. How did this all come about? Simply through the application of an inevitable principle. By the application of intelligently directed power and machinery. In a little dark shop on a side street, an old man had labored for years making axe handles. Out of seasoned hickory he fashioned them, with the help of a draw shave, a chisel, and a supply of sandpaper. Carefully was each handle weighed and balanced. No two of them were alike. The curve must exactly fit the hand, and must conform to the grain of the wood. From dawn until dark the old man labored. His average product was eight handles a week, for which he received a dollar and a half each, and often some of these were unsaleable because the balance was not true. Today you can buy a better axe handle made by machinery for a few cents. And you need not worry about the balance, they're all alike. And every one is perfect. Modern methods applied in a big way have not only brought the cost of axe handles down to a fraction of their former cost, but they have immensely improved the product. It was the application of these same methods to the making of the Ford car that at the very start 
lowered the price, and heightened the quality. We just developed an idea. The nucleus of a business may be an idea. That is, an inventor or a thoughtful workman works out a new and better way to serve some established human need. The idea commends itself, and people want to avail themselves of it. In this way, a single individual may prove, through his idea or discovery, the nucleus of a business. But the creation of the body and bulk of that business is shared by everyone who has anything to do with it. No manufacturer can say, I built this business, if he has required the help of thousands of men building it. It is a joint production. Everyone employed in it has contributed something to it. By working and producing, they make it possible for the purchasing world to keep coming to that business for the type of service it provides. And thus, they help establish a custom, a trade, a habit, which supplies them with a livelihood. That is the way our company grew, and just how I shall start explaining in the next chapter. In the meantime, the company had become worldwide. We had branches in London and in Australia. We were shipping to every part of the world, and in England particularly, we were beginning to be as well known as in America. The introduction of the car in England was somewhat difficult on account of the failure of the American bicycle. Because the American bicycle had not been suited to English uses, it was taken for granted and made a point of by the distributors that no American vehicle could appeal to the British market. Two Model A's found their way to England in 1903. The newspapers refused to notice them. The automobile agents refused to take the slightest interest. It was rumored that the principal components of its manufacture were string and hoop wire, and that a buyer would be lucky if it held together for a fortnight. In the first year, about a dozen cars in all were used. The second was only a little better, and I may say as to the reliability of that Model A that most of them, after nearly 20 years, are still in some kind of service in England. In 1905, our agent entered the Model C in the Scottish reliability trials. In those days, reliability runs were more popular in England than motor races. Perhaps there was an inkling that, after all, an automobile was not a mere toy. The Scottish trials was over 800 miles of hilly, heavy roads. The Ford came through with only one involuntary stop against it. That started the Ford sales in England. In that same time, Ford taxicabs were placed in London for the first time. In the next several years, the sales began to pick up. The cars went into every endurance and reliability test, and won every one of them. The Brighton dealer had ten Fords driven over the South Downs for two days in a kind of steeplechase, and every one of them came through. As a result, 600 cars were sold that year. In 1911, Henry Alexander drove a Model T to the top of Ben Nevis, 4,600 feet. That year, 14,060 cars were sold in England, and it has never since been necessary to stage any kind of stunt. We eventually opened our factory at Manchester. At first, it was purely an assembling plant. But as the years have gone by, we have progressively made more and more of the car.